بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احمده واصلي على رسول الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سنريهم اياتنا في الافاق وفي انفسهم حتى يتبين انه الحق today i'm going to talk about a very very important topic that every student of quran must understand and i'm going to give several examples what is the relationship between the knowledge of the past and the present knowledge we live in and the quran so let me start by mentioning a very important point that when it comes to halal and haram when it comes to what is allowed not allowed what is islamic or not islamic in terms of lifestyle civilization society then you have to go back the farther back you go the more you'll be clear on what is halal what is haram you can say this is zulqarnain of knowledge bringing the two ep- epochs or the two millennia together there is a certain validity of knowledge of a certain type at a certain time by the prophet and his companions sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the process of human discovery the process of human acquired knowledge the increasing amount of seeing the ayat of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the universe that will connect back with quran which is also part of the prophecy and eschatology of the quran so let me share with you from the very beginning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala part of quranic eschatology says sanuri him we will show them meaning the knowledge of the ayat of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be given in its complete form to muslims sanuri him we will show them in the room allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya'lamuna zahiran min al-hayat dunya the romans they know of the zahir of the hayat dunya wa hum an al-akhirati hum ghafilun but of the hereafter they're heedless and we will show them what ayatina are signs fil afaq in the horizons they will get to see the signs of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the horizon in its fullest sense even though the islamic civilization discovered gravity the islamic civilization discovered the spherical world the islamic civilization discovered many things but that knowledge of the afaq of the horizons that goes directly back to quran in its fullest and complete sense of the meaning will be given to them now hold on there's a lot of you can say caveats here so just listen to what i'm saying sanurihim ayatina we will show them our signs fil afaq wa fi anfusihim and in themselves hatta until this knowledge will continue hatta hatta is a conditional phrase haruf shartiya hatta yatabayyana until it is absolutely made clear annahu alhaq that this quran is true this is why this is why what that once knowledge reaches quran from a human perspective once knowledge reaches quran observational knowledge reaches quran people say oh science changes no once a certain knowledge has reached quran or even the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's not going back it came all knowledge is one there's no such thing everything is in allah's knowledge allah's this is allah's creation iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq read in the name of your lord who created read this universe and so when you're reading ar rahman wa allam al quran ar rahman taught the quran it's the same rahman who said ash shams wal qamaru bi husban the sun and the moon are following their calculated orbits or calculated paths precisely calculated and we know that in this time and age this is the exfolding like the prophet said sallallahu alaihi wasallam the quran la tanqitu ajaibuhu its treasures its ajaib its delights will never come to an end there was no sub- subject called quran in science before but now there is because the the miracle of quran today 
is not the linguistic miracle at the time of the Prophet What is the the miracle? The, the Quran is the greatest miracle. So how do we verify the Quran? Well, that is what this process is taking place. That is yatabayyana annahu al-haq. Let me, uh, in terms of the uh, showing you the connection between the ayat of Quran, you know this ayah number fifty-three. سَنُرِهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَةِ We will show them our signs in the horizons وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ and themselves حَتَّى أَنْتِلْ يَتَبَيَّنَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ Until it is absolutely clear that this Qur'an is true. So that exfolding of knowledge will happen. Now please, be aware of something very important. Knowledge is one thing. Technology is not knowledge. Technology will be deceptive. Tech, people and technocrats and companies and institutions that use technology will lie to you and deceive you. Technology will be negative, but then they're going to use technology, they're going to make technology out of that knowledge which is true. And so a lot of times, for example, people say, oh, we can't trust such and such institution, we can't trust, yeah. They lie because the technology part of it, we're able to do this and we're able to do Star Wars and we're able to do this and we're able. That is not the knowledge. Knowledge is that frame of work which we know theoretically, mathematically, empirically. Do you not see based upon observation, but true observation, okay? Not just experiential observation. Yanzuruna means to observe, right? What you'll find very interesting here is in this verse of the Quran where Allah says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaq, we will show them our signs in the horizons, wa fi anfusihim and in themselves, hatta until when until it is clear this Quran is true. Okay? Then what? This is the same surah that has what? The greatest verses in the Quran regarding what? The Da'wa ilallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't, the whole passage here is, and then I just want to mention this one, 33. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا Who is better in statement, in speech, in da'wa, مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ Than the one who calls towards Allah. وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا And does good deeds. So your call, your goal, is to bring people closer to Allah. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And he says, I also submit to Allah. And he also does good deeds. Okay, now let us, inshallah, move forward. And I'm going to give you some examples between the, you can say, the uh, the conflict, okay, that can exist between classical tafsirs and new knowledge and how to bring and under what rules to bring the two together in a Quranic, Quranically proper understanding, okay? So let's also see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. fil ard. Allah says, travel in the world. Fanzuru. Look, observe, have observation. Who did this observation the most? Muslims did this observation the most. But the ending part will be with them. Fanzuru kayfa bada al khalq. See, see how the creation started. Meaning, Allah is telling us to do it. And Allah has told us in Quran that we will be able to do this. See how the creation initiated. Then Allah will start a new creation. Allah has power to do all things. Okay. I'm going to start with simple and then go to more and more complex. Okay. So the first one we're going to start with as an example. Okay, and then I'm going to make it more and more, you can say, complex as we uh, get deeper into this. This point of where is the conflict and where is not the conflict, or how do you merge the together, or how do you leave something of the past and adopt something new? Under what rules? Under what regulations? So we're going to look at some examples so you have some type of training in this issue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, اِتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ Fear the Rabb of yours. الَّذِي The one خَلَقَكُمْ The one who created you. مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدٍ From one soul. وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا And from it created its mate. Now, nafs 
Nafsi Wahida in all the classical tafsirs is referring to who? Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, and created from it its mate is referring to who? Hawa. And is this wrong? No, it's not wrong. But with new knowledge, acquired knowledge, and the divine purpose of bringing knowledge in connection with Quran, Nafs means any living thing, and then Allah created from that living thing its mate. This is called also, nafs could be any living thing, right? Specifically in tafsir, in the classical sense, it's Adam. But it could be any living thing, and then from which it produces its mate. Okay, just like from Adam, Allah created Hawa, okay, from his ribs. And this is what the classical tafsirs like Jalalain and the others, they say. But nafs could be a living cell. And from the living cell, you have the one cell it divides into two, and then the two into four, and four into eight, right? So, let me just uh, show you this, inshallah, here. Uh, so, you see, nafs is, could be any nafs, anything that's living, and it has a way of living, uh, and that from that one cell becomes two cells, and from the two cells it becomes four cells, and so it could be. So, now, would now which tafsir is correct? Is the first tafsir correct, or the second tafsir correct? خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ Allah didn't say خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ آدَمْ وَزَوْجَهَا From Adam and its mate? No. خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةً وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا And because of the word, it becomes even more exact because خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةً وَخَلَقَ مِنْ زَوْجَهَا So you have the cell and the daughter cell process being mentioned in this verse. Both are true. And this is the uh, important point. That the first thing a Mufassir does that when you see two possibilities the first thing you have to do and both are correct you were created from Adam according to Quran itself and you were created from Hawa according to Quran itself and now the wordings of it point to some new knowledge that we have the first thing you have to do is to see if you can merge these two and many many Ibn Abbas and many they had many times an opinion of more than one meaning per verse. In fact, they have said this, you know, in, in different ways. So one verse can have many meanings. Okay? And one verse of Quran can have many aspects. We're going to actually see that. Because without po that possibility, Quran, without that possibility, Quran is stuck in the past. But because Quran is a book of the Arabic language, and the Arabic language is the explanation of Quran. So if something fits the Arabic language, that is how new knowledge will be either accepted or rejected from Quran under the condition that it is consistent with everything else. And I will give maybe some examples of that. But this is the first example I wanted to give to you. اِتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِن نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةً وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا And from there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created its mate. So either it's Adam and Hawa, and then from there we were created, or the one cell, and then from the one cell, two and three inside the womb of the mother, or through any other process. Okay? Now, let us go to the uh, next subject, which is very interesting. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَخْلُقُكُمْ in Surah Al-Zumar, Allah says, we create you in the stomach of your mothers, خَلْقًا مِنْ بَعْضِ خَلْقٍ A creation, one creation after another creation. Meaning one phase after another phase of creation. فِي ظُلُمَاتٍ ثَلَاثٍ In three darknesses. Now what is three darknesses? If you look at the classical tafsirs, it takes it from many different perspectives, metaphorical perspective of the, the different dhulm that man is in. He is going to be born with not knowing anything, he's going to be born with, uh, you know, he's he's going to be forgetful, and also these things, under three darknesses, a triple darkness, okay? Also, some of the scholars later on, like Jalalain, they mentioned that it's referring to the three phases of pregnancy, which, you know, alaqatin, mudratin, like this, okay? Then, uh, what happened? We then found out, oh, there are three layers under which the baby is. 
the anterior abdominal wall, the uterine wall, the amniotic uh, membrane itself, right? Pizulumab and Thalat. Now, which one are you going to accept? The classical tafsir or the new understanding, you can say, of this verse based upon human observation that fits Quran. In this case, in the previous case, you're able to join the two together because there's no contradiction between Adam and Hawa, accepting them and accepting the fact that this is the process of cells replicating, you know, or uh, I'll also mention another way this could be taken. Or now in this case, it seems more logical from the perspective of observation, if somebody wants to give a metaphorical meaning, then they can. But it seems more logical to accept this new information over the past information because it fits more into the literal meaning of the words that the Quran is giving. Okay? So now, over here, I want to mention a very important rule. Um, maybe I'll mention it when we get to the embryology aspect of this. Now, let us take uh, another example. Okay? Uh, let's take uh, the example of the expansion of the uh, universe. Okay? Uh, and the point here is what? The point here is that uh, when you have something confirmed in Quran many times, like in this case, and then you also have it confirmed in observation, then the two will come together. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam yara ladina kafaru, did those who uh, deny the truth not see, anna samawati wal ardi ratqan, that the heavens and the earth were one entity mixed into one another, fataknahuma, and then we blew them both up. We rendered them asunder. Okay. We uh, tore them apart. Okay. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Was and the heavens, we created it. We built it. We constructed it. Bi'aidin with our hands. Wa inna la musi'un. And we are expanding it. Now, we are its extender. We are expanding it. If you combine the ayat together, okay, and if you bring in human observation with it, then what? Then it becomes clear that this lam la musi'un, we are definitely inna la musi'un. When you take the emphasis of inna and was sama'i banaynaha bi aydin wa inna la musi'un, we are expanding it, becomes more, uh, better translation considering the first verse and the emphasis that is being laid down of a process that's continuous, وَإِنَّ لَمُوسِعُونَ because the lam taqid makes more sense uh, in the sense of the present. Okay? So now, the point being here is we know the, uh, you can now say the universe is expanding. Now, if you accept the fact the universe is expanding, then you can say there was a point where the whole universe was together and then it blew up which we sometimes call the Big Bang. Of course now, I want to mention something very, very important. I already mentioned something important. We don't, we don't, we accept the knowledge, not the tech, claims of the technocrats of what they've been able to do, number one. Number two, we don't accept the philosophy behind the observation, meaning uh, somebody who talks about Big Bang, even though Big Bang, uh, according to uh, the the Kalam argument of Imam Ghazali, for example, the very fact the universe, because what the, the atheists wanted initially, and people don't realize this, what the atheists first wanted is to prove that the universe has always been here. But when they found out about the Big Bang, and Alama Iqbal talks about this in his uh, preface of his book, Reconstruction of Islamic Thought, that the atheists would have been very happy with the universe, and some atheists still try to show you a universe that had no beginning. But the Big Bang meant the universe had a beginning, and it is confirmed with Qur'an in its words, in the Arabic words. Now, if you look at the classical tafsir of these verses, they say something else. Now, you can combine the two, or you can uh, accept, if you say, well, no, this one fits better. I know personally people who have accepted Islam because of this verse, of the acceptance of the fact that the universe is expanding. Okay, so... I know the power of Quran when it comes to these 
these issues, you know. Uh, now, uh, let us now look at Sutul uh, Qiyamah, uh, and I only want to make one point here. When the Quran is talking about something, anything that's observable, from what perspective is Quran giving you information? The Quran is giving us information of something observable from the perspective of the observer. Let me give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam, alam yaku nutfatam mimmani yumna. Were you not a sperm that just came out, gushed out? Thumma kana alaqa. Oh, here is a very good example too. I didn't think of talking about this, but since it came up, alaqa has been translated in various ways in our classical tafsir. But we didn't know about the placenta. Alaqa, literally, if those people know Urdu language also, mu'allaq means to be hanging. Okay, and the alaqa is the placenta that's hanging in the womb and taking in the blood. Alaq is also the leech that you put on your blood sometimes to, to, to you know, you can, when the leech gets on your skin, it sucks your blood. This is exactly what the placenta is doing. ثُمَّ كَانَ alaqa, Then the placenta is on you, for and it is like alaqa. It is like this thing that's sucking blood. So we alaqa, we translate it as clot. But that's not right completely in this case especially with the knowledge now we have of embryology. But, ثُمَّ كَانَ عَلَقَةً فَخَلَقَ فَسَوَّ Then we created it and we fashioned it. فَجَعَلَ مِنْهُ الذَّوْجَيْنِ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَ And we made from it ذَكَرْ وَالْأُنْثَ Male and female, this is amongst the last stages of the embryology. Right? أَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ بِقَادِرٍ Is that not that one not uh, able to? قَادِرٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُحِيَ الْمَوْتَ then he will bring life to the dead. Now, what is the main point I'm trying to make here? That it is the observation that the Quran describes. I, I didn't uh, quote the bring in the verse here, but for example, mudra. Mudra means a piece of meat that you've chewed. So when Allah says, uh, you know, alaqatan and then mudratan, it becomes like a placenta that's sucking blood, and then after that it becomes like a meat meat that's chewed. Is it like really meat that's chewed? No, of course not. It's not, right? But what is it? It is the. It is what you will observe is what it is. You will observe. One of my great, great teachers uh, that even though he didn't teach me for a long time, but I really benefited the many times that I did sit with him. Um, but he is the one who wrote a book on this issue, on embryology. And uh, he was Sheikh Mustafa from Chicago. He used to give lectures in Bridgeview and so on and so forth. But the point I'm trying to make is he wrote this book. And uh, I think he did his PhD on that issue. But he, he I think he's an imam now in, in Temple University or somewhere in that area. But the point is he made a very good point in his book. He wrote this very good book in the Arabic language on embryology. And one of the points he makes is this point about, uh, you know, how is Quran describing nature? It is describing nature of what you will see based upon how the Arabs of that time would describe what they are seeing. How they would describe it is one aspect, right? And then the other aspect is that, so that's the literary, and of course there's a literary aspect to this too. But mudra, for example, a chewed-like substance which Quran uses in embryology. It's not that it's a chewed-like substance, obviously not, but it's, it is, it looks like a chewed like substance and it doesn't even say like, but it'll say mudra, which is a, uh, a chewed like, uh, meaning it's, it's chewed, it means chewed like chewed meat, meat that's chewed. Okay. So, uh, when Quran is describing a certain phenomenon, because it is metaphorical in some ways, you'll, we'll also talk about this if we get a chance. Okay. Let's go on to the next issue, evolution. Now, this is a good one, okay, because uh, for many, many reasons. Number one, uh, you know, we always give credit to the non-Muslims for all these things like evolution and so on and so forth, not realizing that there are hints of it within Quran. Now, here, this is another important point. Now, I said that we accept the observations, but not the philosophies behind it, right? So... Evolution is a good example. Uh, we accept that first there was one process, then another process, another process leading up to man. But do we believe in Darwinian evolution? No, of course not. But there was a there was an irtiqa, there was a teleological a, a a moving from one 
level of existence to another, to another, to another. And I'll show you what some of the Muslim scholars said about this. But let's first see what the Quran says, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, Allahu khalaka kullu min, min al Allah created all creatures from water. This is a fact of evolution. And amongst those, there are those that crawl on their stomach. And then there are those that crawl on and they walk on two, two feet. This is the birds, by the way, and the dinosaurs, some reptiles and birds. So the first one is, you know, the snakes and these animals. Then they had legs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first mentions animals that don't have legs. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions animals that have two legs. Then وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يمشي. And this مِنْهُمْ 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 shows a sequence of events. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يمشي عَلَى رجلين. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يمشي عَلَى أَرْبَى And amongst them are those that then became four-legged. Right? So, وَفَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يمشي عَلَى بَطْنِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يمشي عَلَى رجلين. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يمشي عَلَى أَرْبَى So this is a process. Okay? Is this a Darwinian evolution? No, of course not. Because number one, we're saying Allah did it. And number two, we're not saying the, the Darwinian uh, observation of human beings shows some truth, but not necessarily all truth, right? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Allah astafa Adam. <coughs> Allah chose Adam. Istafa, like the word Mustafa for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Istafa is used to choose something. There was something to choose from, so Allah chose Adam. What is there to choose if there's no, uh, so like some scholars of Islam will say, and there is some evidence of this because of the word Bashar in Quran, that there were human-like beings in the world, the Java man, the Nandrathal, these different Lucy and all these different human-like beings, out of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose one of them for the ruh. The possibility. Is this qat'i? There's another point. Not everything, just because something becomes a possibility and it connects to Qur'an, how much it's connecting to Qur'an, it will have different degrees. Something will connect to Qur'an, absolutely. Okay, like in the case of the expansion of the universe. Some things will connect to Qur'an at a level of probability. We call it dhanni in, in, in Islamic uh, literature. But it's... It's not 100%, but there is a good reason to say that this could be the case. In the last of Adam, there were other human-like beings, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose one of them, being Prophet Adam alayhi salatu wa salam. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayah, وَخَلَقَكُمْ atwara. We created you in stages, in one stage to another, another stage, right? هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ He's the one who created you from dust, right? In water, dust and water is thin. ثُمَّ قَضَاءَ جَلَى and then he put it down a term for your creation after that. These All these verses, they're not qat'i, they're not definite, but they point to something, which we generally call evolution, but not in the Darwinian sense, but in the fact that there was a general process that we were all human, all beings are created from water, a process that is similar to it, but not, but not that process itself. Okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Several times, Allah said, "He, we made you grow. We initiated you from we, we like a plant grows. We created you from the earth. Like it's like you grew up from the earth, right? And then, of course, the word bashar, which means skin. Bashar means skin. And one thing about when you study uh, evolution in this in in the schools." Uh, one of the things they teach you is that what one thing that was special about human beings is that we were we had less hair than other animals. You can see more skin, right? Rijal, the Homo erectus, the very very idea of walking on two feet, right? Walking on your feet. Rijal, rajul means legs, and this is very because this was the you know uh, the way they describe it in schools, and this not this is you know this is just conjecture. That we were on trees and then we got off of trees and that's how we learned to really walk the way we do. May be true, may not be true, but it has nothing to do with Quran other than the fact that yes, there's an emphasis on the man's ability to walk in a very significantly differently different way than other animals. And also in in those who study evolution, they also consider that the Homo erectus, the 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 Homo sapien 
the Homo erectus came before the Homo sapien. Homo sapien is us, but other human-like species, what was specifically special about them was their ability to walk on two legs, which is also derived from the word Kijat. So when you, what did I, what did we do here? What we did here is we brought many different verses together, okay, and put them together and said, if there is a, a process in this case, like evolution, do the different aspects of the processes fit together, right? So if you're like, for example, if you want to see something about Earth, which we will in a little bit, then what? Then uh, we will also see other aspects around Earth, even though I don't go into detail about that. But you get the point, inshallah. Okay, let us now go to the next. Uh, I don't have translations here. I'll give them to you. Now you have a very interesting situation here between classical tafsirs and what was the human knowledge that was found over time, okay? And remember, a majority of this, the foundations of it are laid in the Islamic civilization itself, right? For example, for, let's go over the Quran and then I'll show you what the Muslim scientists said. And then also you have to look at a very important point. You have to look at tafsir from the perspective of its specialties. Not all tafsirs are equal. Imam Zamakshiri, you'll go to him if you want to understand what? Language. Okay. You'll go to Imam uh, Tabari, for example, or Qurtubi, if you want to understand narrations. Ibn Kathir, if you want to understand which aspects of the Bible in Israeliyat you can accept or can't accept. Like this, there is every tafsir is not equal. Then also, then there are certain Muslims who were working on a specific aspect, right? Uh, of the Quran, you can say, a certain specific aspect of the Quran, they were specialized in that aspect. So those people that were specialized in a certain science, in a certain field, but were inspired by Quran, then that then those specialists should be looked at before we look at the general commentaries. So we will look at, for example, a Muslim physicist explaining the ayat of Quran and the creation of the heavens and the earth. We will look at what they said first before we look at a general commentary. This is true as a rule in, in Islamic law, that when you want to, how do we know the definition of something? Well, either you will A, depending upon the fiqhi issue, you will either go to the specialist, meaning if it's a question of, is Allah said something about fish? Well, now let me define fish. How will I know what is a fish? Well, I go to a specialist, and now I know what a fish is. Or, in some cases, you don't go to the specialist, and you leave it general, and then, therefore, then you ask the masses, what is your definition of this? Depending upon the case of the situation, then you will decide that, based upon which has more khair in it, which has more benefit in it, right? So, the shape of the earth. Wal-arda firasha. The earth is a firash, a floor, okay, like a rug, a mat, okay? So that contradicts the fact that there's mountains and valleys and edges and all these things. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, in the Quran, in fi khalq samawati wal ard. Oh, I wanted to show you guys something before I continue this. Um, I just wanted to show you this. Uh, Pre-Darwinian eras, biologists in the Islamic world are believed to have some glimpse of evolution. Mainly biologists like famous uh, uh, Jahaz, he goes into Alama Rumi. Oh, he has whole poetry on the process of evolution. Okay, uh, the Sayyid theologian, theologian Sayyid Nursi stated the Earth was already inhabited by intelligence be beings before mankind, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, uh, and then of course. Uh, some of the scientists, Muslim scientists, uh, have mentioned, uh, you can say, various aspects of uh, evolution also. Okay. Um, let me show you this. Uh, so, this was as far as thousand years before Darwin, Islamic scholars were writing about natural selection. Okay. And... Uh, and so it's very possible that a lot of these things, uh, let me just show you, like uh, here's a good example, okay? Uh, Al-Biruni, who lived 800 years before Darwin, believed that man migrated through the kingdoms of mineral, plants, animals. So from one 
phase of creation to another phase in order to reach perfection and therefore contains within himself the nature of the creation of other realms. Okay? Uh, he thought that monkeys were the creature that man had migrated for before being human. Okay? Ibn Khaldun of the 14th century North African Muslim thinker wrote, it started out from minerals and progressed in an ingenious gradual manner to plants, animals, the animal world then widens, its species become numerous, in gradual process of creation it finally leads to man who is able to think and to reflect. Okay, so who said this? Ibn Khaldun. Okay, and then of course you had the Persian philosopher who also uh, wrote about this. But anyway, the point is that these are not ideas that are foreign to Muslim in the Islamic civilization and Darwin just because we had a what happened is in the Muslim world we had a reaction to everything secular and we forgot that we were the ones that gave you know Antali the Ammat Rabbata had the Prophet said the, the Ummah will give birth to its master and so now when the master is telling us anything we have an allergic reaction not realizing that the Ummah was the one that taught who is now our master uh, a lot of these concepts so in the same way about the shape of the earth, uh, you know, wal arda fi rasha. Now you'll see you have to bring different parts together to have a whole sense, right? Wal arda fi rasha, the earth is a floor, and then Allah subhanahu wa taala at the same time says, inna fi khalq al-samawati wal ard wa khtilaf al-layl wal nahar. In the alteration, in the change of the day and the night. Right, not in the change of the sun and the moon, but rather the change in the day and the night. And the day and night has to do with what? Has to do with the earth. Thus, therefore, in nafi khalqis samawati wal ardi. And after mentioning the earth, this is now wa'ut tafsiri. What about the earth? The, specifically, the alteration of the night and the day. Okay. And also, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions the earth is spread out. So in that regard. In other verses, for example, Alam takun ardu wasiatun was not the earth of Allah expansive enough uh, fiha that you do hijra in it, meaning when Allah mentions we expanded it, one of the aspects of it uh, is that you can do hijra in it. You can go from one place to another. Right? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Afalam Yasiru fil Ard Fanzuru, do you not travel the earth and see? Why would Allah tell us to travel the earth if we're going to fall off the edge, right? So, of course, Fanzuru, observe, observe. Why should you travel the earth to observe, okay? The Islamic civilization, these are the verses that exploded knowledge. Allah extended the world. And then put in place mountains, mountain ranges as Rawasiya versus Jibal. Jibal is smaller mountains, you know, like, but when you have mount ranges, mountain ranges, that's Rawasiya, Wal Anhar, and many, many rivers, okay? In the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, very interestingly enough, Walladhi Madd al He extended the earth. وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا رَوَاسِيَ وَالْأَنْحَارِ وَمِنْ كُلِّ ثَمَرَاتٍ جَعَلْنَا فِيهَا زَوْجَيْنِ اثْنَيْنِ And for every plant Allah has made its pair. يُغْشَ اللَّيْلَ عَلَى النَّهَارِ يُغْشَ اللَّيْلَ النَّهَارِ And the night covers the day. Right? The night is covering the day. The night is covering the day. So the night is overpowering. The night is the rule. And the day is the exception. Okay, so in the universe, night is the rule, the day is the exception. Indeed, and this is signs, for people that will reflect. Okay, then also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions opposite forces coming together. Okay, for Allah is whatever whatever is in the heaven and the earth bows down to Allah, does to Allah. Willingly or unwillingly. Now, when you're understanding the shape of the earth, you have to keep all of these things in mind. I'm coming to other aspects. وَجَعَلْنَا الْأَرْضَ رَوَاسِيَ أَن تَمِيدَ بِهِمْ Okay, and we made the earth have mountain ranges, lest it should, what? Shake. Now, there's no reason if we are on a flat plane that the earth would shake. It's only when it's round and the crust is a very thin layer. Like if you had... Uh, you know, if you had like a, 
around, let's say, orange, right? Actually, I have something here. I thought I saw something drop, but I guess not. Okay, let's say you have a round orange. Let me do it this way. Okay, if you had a round orange, okay, and there is a very thin layer, the crust is very, very thin, it, it, the paper doesn't hold unless you put pins in it, right? Pins around it. Now it will hold, okay? So that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, means here, right? Ja'ala fil ardi rawasi an tamida bihim, that the earth would also bend. And we made the earth like a bed for you. It's not literally a bed. And the earth after that became like an egg shape. That's there. On the one side, Allah says, Quran says, the, the Quran says the earth is plain and leveled out for you. And over here is, This is a process. And we caused the earth to crack in different places. Okay, wal arda that is sadri, and the earth that cracks. Okay, wal wa ila al ardi kafa sotihad, and don't you look at the earth how we've made it leveled out? Okay, so how do you now connect leveled out with the fact that the shape of the earth is clearly an egg? Don't give me this, you know, what the past scholars said, because Muslim scholars over and over again, okay, have said the shape of the earth is what. The shape of the earth from this is the Abbasid Empire. This is the Ottoman Empire. Some of this is the Mughal Empire. We're talking about Islamic civilizations, Islamic empires, people and scientists who spent their entire lives, and it became the Ijma. Okay, uh, just as an, a, an example, uh, you know, uh, Ghazani was the first to propose the theory of universal gravitation. It's not a NASA thing, or it's not a Western thing. It's an Islamic thing. It's an Islamic idea based upon Islamic verses of the Quran where Allah is talking about opposite forces coming together because Allah creates everything in pairs. And so, uh, you know, there were Muslims who even saw it just beyond the Milky Way too. Okay, Ibn Haytham made the first attempt at observing and measuring the Milky Way as a prax, uh, as a parallax. Okay, so these are the people, the giants, who spent their, okay, uh, Haifa made the earliest attempt at applying the experimental method to astronomy and astrophysics. He disproved and universal, universally held opinion that the moon reflects sunlight like a mirror and correctly concluded also, they're also being, and there's a whole PhDs by uh, Sayyid uh, Nasr and his students that it was the Quran that was the impetus and the and the and the motivation to make these logical conclusions and to understand this because Quran mentions this that it, held, it was universally held the opinion was held the moon reflects its own light and correctly concluded that it emits light based upon those portions of its surface which the sun light strikes this is not NASA this is Muslims okay and then you have a uh, uh, Hujundi accurately calculated the axle tilt of the earth. Okay, and you can go on and on of every aspect that we we are taught today in schools of modern physics, uh, especially no Newtonian physics. Okay, every aspect of it agrees with what? Agrees with what the Muslims have said. Now, what is my point here? My point here is that if someone comes in contradiction and does not follow the logical line of progression, starting from the Muslim civilization and then moving onward, and will choose general tafsirs and, and ignore the specialists, and will ignore the ijma, ignore the specialists, uh, and and look at you know uh, you know grasp for evidence based upon uh, classical things that don't fit new knowledge period it's like you know if now we now we know our qibla the formulas of the qibla are based upon a circular earth and to deny a circular earth would just be not right at that because there's ijma on the qibla and uh, there is ijma on uh, the earth being spherical as knowledge increased this is where we ended up 
Okay, a very good example of this is we didn't know who Zulkarnain was, but now we know, and to deny it is silly. We don't didn't know who Ya'juj and Ma'juj was. Classical tafsirs were wrong about it many times, but now we know. We accept it. And this is all part of the Qur'an opening itself up and showing this is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And so, uh, you know, and, and so you can go on and on, okay, about this issue. But uh, let me go back over here. So, on the one side, the Qur'an says the earth is cracked. On the other side, it says it's leveled. On the one side, it says it's a bed. On the other side, it says it's an egg shape. On the one side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, what? Uh, then, وَالْأَرْضَ, uh, والأرض وَمَا تَحَاهَا and then, uh, and then, look at this. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ كِفَاتَ Did not we make the earth self-containing itself? It's holding up itself. It doesn't need anything else. Okay, it's a container in it itself. It's not being held in any way. It's kifata. It's holding itself. The same as that. Allah turns, rolls the night into the day. And He rolls the day into the night. If you go to even, you know, Mufti Google, right? And you ask Google, what is rolling or a ball? Karra. And from Karra you get Yukawiru. Okay? In the, I found it, these results. So, Yukawiru uh, Laylan. Allah turns, rolls like a ball, the night into the day. That means the earth is the thing that's rolling. Like ikhtilaf al-layli wa nahar Now you get two portions of the Qur'an that are synchronized, giving you a picture. يُكَوِّرُ اللَّيْلَ عَلَى النَّهَارِ وَيُكَوِّرُ النَّهَارَ عَلَى اللَّيْلِ Right? So, كُلُّ uh, يَجْرِ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they're all traveling their orbits until an appointed time. Okay? يُكَوِّرُ اللَّيْلَ عَلَى النَّهَارِ وَسَخَرَ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرِ And he subjugated the sun and the moon. كل, all of them. All of what? All is not referring to two. All is referring to three. So that's referring to the creation of the earth and whatever is in Samawat and whatever is in uh, and the shams and the qamar. All of them are moving in their, uh, in their orbits. Okay? To a certain, to an appointed time. Okay, so now uh, let me give you one final example on this issue. Um, and that is going to be this study that I wrote like about, I think, 15 years ago. Quran and sperm production. Okay, and the idea is what? Many meanings and no contradiction. So now I took a verse of the Quran that is generally translated like this. Uh, sorry, I think it's here. Okay. خل, uh, يخرج من بين السلم والتراب The sperm that comes between the backbone and the breast bones, meaning the backbone and the breast bone in the front. Now, some people were making fun of Quran and saying, what type of book is this? It says the sperm comes out from the backbone. We know the sperm does not come out from the backbone. So I uh, did a lot of research and I wrote this article. And so now let me go over some of the aspects of this article to make a point about, uh, to make a point about, inshallah, on the topic of, uh, on this topic. Okay. So now uh, let me just show you very, very quickly. Okay. So. When I did the research on this, okay, uh, I came up with uh, eight different uh, meanings of the words. Now, if we took it in the classical way, people would continue to make fun of these words, and it, it needed to be revised, needed to be looked at. So the different meanings of this verse can be as follows. Between the loins of men and the ribs of the women. Turab is 
circular bone. Could be the collarbone, could be the pelvis, right? And sun can refer to the lower back or to the loins uh, of the men. So between the the pelvis uh, of the female and the uh, the loins of man, or the, so between the loins of men and ribs of women, any curved bone. So it could be the ribs, and could be also the pelvis. Between the that's the um, uh, so be what taraib is taraib is any curved bone okay between the lower back sul and the ribs of women between the lower back and the ribs of man okay and between the loins and the ribs of men the lower back symbolic of man's strength and chest symbolic of woman's nurturing nature okay loins of man and the pelvic bone meaning the curved bones right of the woman that's where the baby is okay so between the pelvis and the the male that's where it, it comes out, it goes into the sperm, okay? Lower back of the male pelvic region of the woman, okay? It refers to an area within the male body in which the processes of the sperm making and omission take place. And I explained this in detail, I can't go over all of the paper, but I explained that in this paper, uh, you know, that, uh, that all of these are true in fact, okay? Because when the embryo, when the baby, okay the gonads of the baby okay the, the 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 sex aspect of the baby is literally between the uh you could say between the ribs and the backbone where you see the picture of the uh, the gonad here okay so you have to be able to what you have to be able to uh see, see also i looked showed this diagram uh to explain some aspects of this issue right then also that uh, how it's connected to some of these uh, reproductive organs, especially in the male, is connected to the uh, chest. I'm not going to go into that. But, you know, I, I, I did this research and, uh, and it was very interesting, right? Um, so the point being that now let me uh, mention uh, another uh, issue, okay? And that is that uh, this is now... Uh, an example of something that is not qat'i, but it's interesting, could be true, and many people will say it's not true, but you know what? It's there in Quran, and so therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, iqtarabati sa'a, the hour has approached, has become very near wa shaq al-qamar when shaq al-qamar could refer to specifically asbab al-nuzul what? The Prophet splitting the moon but shaq al-qamar can also refer to when someone goes to the moon and cuts the moon into and, and takes the moon rocks and brings them back. Now, you may say, oh, how could it be really referring to that? Because of the word shaqqa yushaqqu, what it means. Okay. Now, I'll just mention one thing here. Uh, I'll just read this to you. Now, did the prophecy come to pa pass to answer that one must keep a prophecy in mind? The moon has split. This is a metaphor. Parts of the moon uh, have left its surface. Actually, it's very exact, and I'll show you the dictionary in a second. But prophecy of splitting the moon was very, uh, very moment. Mo it was an important moment for astronauts when they left the moon in the lunar module containing 21 kilograms of rocks that belonged to the moon. Because Shaqqa also means hafara, to dig out. It also means to break. It, I'm going to show you all those meanings, okay? Uh, among the definitions given in dictionary.com to divide, to disunite, and so on and so forth. The moment the prophecy was fulfilled is confirmed by the hour of departure of the lunar module, which left the lunar surface at 1754-1. Okay, as we know, the verse itself is 54-1. That deals with the prophecy. The minute and second of the departure is the same as the chapter number and the verse number of the prophecy. Also, the mathematical miracle of the Quran based on number 19 confirms this prophecy too. And he gives his uh, whole thing. It's interesting to that the word moon in 54.1 is the 19th occurrence of this word from the beginning of Quran out of a total of 26 occurrences. Now, is this something definite? Like, oh, this definitely proves that man went to the moon? No, it doesn't, right? But it uh, it does give it the possibility is there. 
that that happened. By the way, shakka means to cleave, to split, to rift apart, to render, to tear, to break, to burst asunder. That's what they did with the rocks. Uh, okay, uh, to slash. Okay, to uh, split, to cut. Okay, and so to cut is what they did with the rocks of the moon and brought brought them down back to earth. Now, so if something fits Quran, it's a possibility. But not everything is qatari. Not everything will be hundred percent. You can't. You can say this ayah is indicating this fact. Some things are very very clear. Why? Because these are specifically talking about the movement of something, the shape of something. That is the subject matter being discussed. And uh, it doesn't contradict the other parts of the Quran that say the Quran is, the Quran says the earth is expanded, the Quran is spread out, the Quran says the earth is spread out. It doesn't mean it's literally a bed. It doesn't mean that وَجَعَلَ الْأَرْضَ مِحَذَ And we made the earth a bed. It doesn't mean a literal bed. It means it functions as a bed, a place where you can rest, a place you can have sakina, a place so, so and so forth, right? Uh, so now, uh, I, I wanted to bring this to your attention to show you that this is actually interesting because the Kahaf talks about Surah Qarnayn, the two time periods. What are the function of the two time periods? You will get your deen, your, your halal and your haram from the past. But knowledge is exfoliating and the ayat are being exposed. When you see those ayat touch the Quran, then what? Then that is, now you will consider this in reference to what has been said in the past. And some of those things will be qat'i, definitely, you have to accept it. Like the round shape of the earth because of the qibla, because of the ijma of the qibla, and so on and so forth. And so the, some things you'll have to do qat'i, you have to accept it. Something will be, maybe it's true, it sounds interesting. Like, let me give you another example, okay, on this issue. Um, well, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran uh, what? Uh, that when the trumpet is السور, when we blow on the trumpet now the shape of the universe according to some scientists is the trumpet now is this qat'i or dhanni? no, this is interesting it could be true that the shape of the universe is a trumpet and this is why an instrument that you're not normally allowed to use is being used for this metaphor of the universe Right, because the shape of the universe is like a trumpet, and so therefore, when the trumpet is blown, right. So, sur is also something that's mostly hollow in the middle, as you know. That's one of the uh, truths of this universe we have. So, the point being that is it definitely that? No, because this is not saying the universe is in the shape of the shape of sur. You're connecting two things that seem to connect, but it's not qata, it's not exact, right? Whereas when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, is describing the phases of embryology, there's alaqa, and then there is a placenta that's there. There is yukawwiru layla ala nahar, there is the turning of the earth around, right? Uh, the rotating of the earth around, uh, around, from which it gets its day and night. That's exact, that's qata'i. Okay, that's ijma'ah. You can't deny that, right? So there are degrees of accepting this uh, knowledge. The main point, again, uh, that I want to mention, four of them. Number one, for halal and haram in our lifestyle, you go into the past. New knowledge, if it touches Quran, either it is going to be qat'i or dhanni. Okay? Number two, the Quran describes the observed phenomenon, what you observe. Okay, number three, technology and claims of technology and what technology can do is not science and is not part of this knowledge. It has nothing to do with the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because science is the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so I'll end here. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this talk of mine a blessing for you and me and a barakah for me and you and a guidance for me and you and open... Uh, a, an understanding of how to look at uh, contradictions between classical tafsirs and knowledge that has been gained uh, since then. 
what aspects do we go to the past for specifically and how do we accept something that of knowledge that is coming to Quran okay all right inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh